all right so now we move on to one of the most fundamental properties of fourier transforms which is perhaps the most widely used in the entire signal analysis and signal processing field which is that the fourier transform of a convolution operation in time you should start understanding now when i am operating performing some operation in time domain behind the scenes some operation is happening in the frequency domain and we have no say on it there is an invisible thread that's connecting the time domain and the frequency domain and these properties are telling us what connections these threads have and what kind of uh, repercussions you have in the frequency domain so this uh, property specifically says if i convolve two signals in time domain when when do i run into this kind of an operation where do i run into convolution operations in all linear time invariant systems when i uh, uh, excite the system with an input what is the system doing it is actually convolving the input with its impulse response and producing the output correct so any linear time invariant system any linear filter when it is excited by an input it actually performs this convolution operation and this property tells me that in frequency domain what is happening is a product operation so convolution operation in time domain translates to product in frequency domain now the beauty of this result cannot be explained in 5 minutes but at least you should appreciate the fact that convolution operation is somewhat complicated operation in time domain you can see it's not a straight forward product correct whereas the equivalent in frequency domain is a very simple algebraic operation which is simply a product all right and the other thing before again we dwell on this other thing that you should understand is what fourier transform is essentially doing for you is it is collecting all the information in the signal over the entire time from minus infinity to infinity and shrinking it to one point in frequency domain which is at f right we we had expression earlier for dtft you have seen it before what is it doing it is summing up the signal over the entire time so uh, that's the uh, that's another way of looking at fourier transform that you are really collecting all the features of the signal the entire uh, 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 over the entire existence and shrinking it to a single point in frequency domain and that perspective helps us in understanding this of course proving this is pretty straight forward you can actually just sit down in two three steps you can prove that this result holds but getting a perspective really helps so what is the convolution operating operation doing it's multiplying two signals not in a straight forward way it is actually reflecting one of the signals there are in fact four operations involved hidden in a convolution operation and what are the four operations you can see at least you can name one is reflection of the signal right and then shifting it and then multiplying those two signals and then summing up so those are the four operations involved in a convolution operation and therefore from a computational view point it can be heavy on the computer whereas in the frequency domain it is simple product of course you may argue who will give me x1 of f to go from x1k to x1 of f i have to again do a computation but efficient algorithms computationally efficient algorithms exist for computing fourier transform so you can make use of that in fact towards the end of today's lecture or uh, let's hope that we reach that i list the commands in r that do, uh, that are relevant to what we have discussed until now what we have learned until now and one of them is going to be convolution and this convolve routine in r implements uh, calculate uh, uh, calculates this convolution by going into the fourier domain that is computes the fourier transforms of those two signals multiplies them and then does an inverse fourier transform that's supposed to be a lot more efficient than straightforward uh, convolution operation in time domain and in fact almost all the routines in in all software packages even if you take matlab and so on the convolution operation 
is implemented using this property. But that is as far as computation of convolution is concerned. But the use of this property is a lot more particularly in theoretical analysis of linear time invariant systems. We have seen yesterday, we have used this pro, uh, property to understand what the LTI system does to an input in the frequency domain. That means it gives us insights into filtering characteristics, correct? When I look at this result in the context of linear time invariant systems, I can think of x2 as the uh, impulse response and x1 as the input or vice versa, does not matter and uh, x being the output and this result tells me that the linear time invariant system is somehow altering the frequency content of the input and what is responsible for altering the frequency content g of f and plotting mod of g of f versus f tells me gives me a lot of valuable information about the filtering nature of the system and we will also discuss this briefly in the context of random processes and then you will understand what is meant by white noise and colored noise and so on, right? Fine. Uh, so, we will move on and uh, look at the dual of convolution. You, you should expect product in time domain corresponds to convolution in frequency domain. Uh, that is the beauty again of the duality. And finally, we look at this correlation theorem which is nothing but the equivalent of wiener kinchin theorem that we will learn in the stochastic world. This is the wiener kinchin theorem version for the deterministic world. It says that the Fourier transform of the cross covariance, a signal processing people would like to call this as cross correlation. I have already cautioned you on that. That is why it is called correlation theorem. The Fourier transform of the cross covariance, again assuming x1 and x2 are finite energy aperiodic signals is nothing but your energy spectral, cross energy spectral density. So, the figure on the right shows how you can obtain the cross energy spectral density in different ways. Uh, for example, I mean I am showing this only, uh, sorry I am only showing this for auto energy spectral density, not the cross energy spectral density, but the same applies to the cross one uh, as well. To arrive at the auto energy spectral density, for example, I can actually take the Fourier transform and simply take the squared magnitude that is one root, right? And the other root is to take the cross covariance and uh, sorry auto covariance and take the Fourier transform, right? And then uh, of course, there, are, there is another root which we will talk about later on. But those are the two different routes that you can take. The one that you see here which is the Fourier transform route to arrive at the energy spectral density is fine for deterministic signals and I have been saying this earlier also. For random signals this route is closed. If I mean uh, uh, if you think of this as a power spectral density of a random signal, this route is not as straightforward as it appears. And in fact, to adopt this route, one has to turn to what is known as generalized harmonic analysis that was introduced by Wiener, but we will not discuss it at all. I uh, will just briefly mention it. We will not use the generalized harmonic analysis route. We will primarily use this route that is we compute the autocovariance and take the Fourier transform and arrive at the uh, spectral density there. Okay. So, you should now again appreciate that this result unifies the world of deterministic and stochastic signals, but you should be cautious. In the world of deterministic signals, we are only talking of energy spectral density. We have never talked about power spectral density at all, right? Because in the deterministic world, periodic signals are what we have looked at for power signals <coughs> and periodic signals do not have a density, they only have a distribution. And, uh, and the moment we move to aperiodic signals, we say for the Fourier transform to exist, it needs to be finite energy. Therefore, we only talk of energy spectral density. So, there is, uh, there has been no scope for discussing power spectral density at all in the deterministic world. The random signal world will offer that uh, opportunity. Okay. So, that kind of concludes the most important properties. There is a huge list, other list of properties 
we do not have to worry about those. These were I thought the most important ones for this course. Uh, usually one finds a table of properties, you can find them everywhere, almost everywhere, right? Uh, except maybe at Amazon and so on, but everywhere else you can find. Fine. So now we turn to the practical implementation of DTFT. How having learned so much, we have also learned that DTFT is extremely useful in theoretical analysis, but what about practical signal analysis? And we had asked two questions in this regard yesterday. One is that the signals encountered in reality are first of all finite in length and they are not necessarily periodic of course, right? That is the first issue for only I have only finite length measurements and secondly I have a computation issue I can only compute over a grid of frequencies. So these are the two issues that we have. So keep the DTFT in mind and ask these two questions. So, x of f theoretically is x k e to the minus j 2 pi f k running from minus infinity to infinity. Now, I want to compute x of f for some signal. At the moment, do not worry whether uh, let us assume that the signal is still deterministic. Let us not worry about the randomness uh, in the measurements and so on. So, I am presented with those two issues. How do I? handle these two issues. Can I for example only evaluate the Fourier transform over the length of the signal that I have? That is a natural idea that comes to mind, right? In, in other words, can I truncate this summation to the duration of the signal that I have? Is it okay to do that or not? Will it get me exactly x of f? It will not. Right? Let us pose the question the other way around. Given the finite length signal that we have, can we somehow reconstruct the infinitely long signal? Is it possible? It may be an approximation that is okay, but is there a way to do it? What are the different ways in which I can reconstruct? See essentially what we are asking is I have only observed for n time instants. I do not know what was happening in the signal before I started observing and after my experiment. Now can I do some kind of imagination and reconstruct the infinitely long signal? Yeah, assume that, the signal was periodic. that is one. So essentially now what we are getting into is extensions of signals beyond the observation period. One is a periodic extension. So you assume that the signal is periodic. Is it a fair assumption? Very bad, isn't it? Okay. What is the other assumption, uh, assumption that we can make? That it was zero before and after. Is that a good one? That is also not good. What do we do? Some extension you can. So you can think of this problem as a problem of reconstructing the infinitely long signal with the given finite length. That is one way of looking at it. The other way of looking at it is, you say that. I am only going to work, I do not know what happened outside, well this is essentially uh, what we are going to do, but I am only going to truncate, I am going to truncate the summation to the length of uh, the duration. In effectively you are saying the signal is 0, correct? But then we have this another issue. We have this another issue which is computing this on a calculator or a computer and we can only do this over a grid, right? So now we say that I cannot compute at all f in this interval, but I can only compute at discrete points in f. Therefore, we now introduce discretization of f and now call let us say this as x subscript fn. Do you expect, uh, expect x of f at nth point in frequency to be identical to this? It will not, right? So I may need some reconstruction if I am interested in this. If I am interested in the, the x of f, the continuous function, 
this is not a continuous function in the sense it is the domain here is now discrete. In fact, we will use a notation x of n like we have used x of k for the discrete time signal. Now you should remember that k denotes time instant and n denotes the frequency point, grid point, right. So we introduce x of n which is nothing but this Fourier transform, this is a finite length Fourier transform evaluated over a grid. We have not made any decision on what should be the grid size. So what we have done is two things, we have truncated the summation and we have discretized the frequency axis. Now let us see what is the consequence and by the way this is what is nothing but is called the DFT, the discrete Fourier transform. Now we drop the T in DTFT because now both time and frequency axis are discrete. In DTFT only the time is uh, discrete. And this is what your FFT algorithms implement, this uh, DFT. This is what people use widely. You may wonder how, how can I use this, what warrants the usage of this, what does it mean to work with this kind of a transform, okay. This is called by, I mean if, if you were to, uh, we will come to the endpoint DFT shortly, but essentially now we have to ask before we start using this, what is the meaning of using this? transform as against working with this. I want this but I am working with this and moreover I do not even know if I should use DTFT or DTFS because I do not know a priori whether the given signal is periodic or aperiodic. Until now we have studied different classes of Fourier transform, Fourier series and so on, assuming that I know a priori whether the signal is periodic or otherwise. But now we are really touching, you know, we are coming face to face with reality and saying I do not know a priori if the signal is periodic, I do not know if uh, I do not have infinitely long signal and I cannot compute over a continuum of frequencies and so on. Obviously this is the most practical thing that you can think of. But before we use this, we have to ask what does it mean with respect to the, the correct one that I should be using. If the underlying signal was periodic, what should, what is the kind of uh, tra transform or uh, analysis that I should be doing? Fourier series, I should be computing Fourier series coefficients. And if the under underlying signal is aperiodic, I should be working with DTFT, but I do not know any of that, <laughs> right. All I know is I can compute this and this is what my FFT does for me. Now we will briefly ask two questions, one how should I choose a grid spacing and two what is the consequence of working with this DFT with respect to the actual one that I should be using. So uh, let us ask actually the first answer the first question which is what should be the grid spacing. Now before we discuss the result, let me draw parallels of this question with the question that was raised by people long ago in the context of sampling a continuous time signal. See you, you should see that x of f is a continuous function and I am asking how this continuous function should be sampled in frequency. A similar question was asked long ago in the context of sampling where I need to figure out how fast should x of t be sampled so as to produce a discrete time signal, right. How frequently should I sample a continuous time signal assuming that I am going to sample uniformly. That is what gave birth to the sampling theorem, the celebrated sampling theorem by Nyquist, Whittaker, Shannon and so on which says that if the signal has a frequency, maximum frequency f that is a continuous time signal, then the minimum sampling rate that you should choose is twice. Later on people said yeah it is all common sense and even if you look at Newton's law, anything now will we'll say yeah, it is all common sense man. It was, it must have been so easy to devise a smartphone for example you can say few years later what is this. Anything in hindsight looks easy even our 10 standard questions and so on. But when you are at it at that time, 
it is it is a great uh, invention. So, it is obvious now that yeah the sampling minimum sampling rate has to be twice the maximum frequency, but how did people arrive at that result? One of the criteria that was used is I should not have a loss of information when I sample. What does it mean by loss of uh, no loss of information? <coughs> what it means is if I were to be required to go back to this x of t that means if I have to reconstruct this x of t from the discrete time in principle I should be able to do it. Whether I will do it or not it is a secondary thing but there should be sufficient information in x of k to be able to recover x of t. The same question can be asked here, the same criteria can be imposed here. If I were to recover x of f from its discretized version then I should be able to do it. We do not do it let me tell you we do not recover x of f practically, but theoretically you should guarantee that you have chosen the grid spacing in such a way that there is no loss of information. And it turns out that here in the DFT the grid spacing in frequency domain should be 1 over the length of the signal. That is a minimum grid spacing you should have you can have more than that like your minimum sampling rate. So, it says the minimum grid spacing is uh, <coughs> or oh sorry the maximum grid spacing is uh, 1 over m I am sorry about that right. So, delta f n should be 1 over n where n is the length of the signal or I have used n subscript l in the slide n l is the length of the signal. So, x of f is perfectly recoverable from x of f n when delta f n is 1 over n l that means if I have 1000 points that is 1000 observations of a signal the frequency grid is of spacing 0 0.001 and what this also tells me is that I will compute by the way I can notice from the property of by the way this fn let me first tell you what is fn, fn is now n by n I will throw away the subscript now. So, the nth frequency is simply n over big uh, small n over big n and n runs from now n should run from 0 up to n minus 1 why not n it will repeat. So, the same story what we have learnt in discrete time Fourier series. So, now you see there is some similarity of this DFT with some Fourier series when do we use discrete time Fourier series when the signal is periodic. So, something is now hiding behind the bushes there that is some interpretation is waiting. It is a question that we asked earlier what is the consequence of working with this kind of a transform right. Earlier we thought we are assuming the signal is 0 outside, but now it turns out that the assumption is that the signal is actually periodic with what period the length of the signal like that is what you had said earlier you can assume a periodic extension. We started off by truncating the signal by assuming the signal to be 0 outside, but then we did one more thing which is discretizing the frequency axis. Had we not discretized then that 0 outside the observation interval assumption is correct, but the moment we sampled in the frequency domain we have introduced periodicity assumption in the time domain that is what we mean by sampling in time introduces periodicity in frequency we have already seen that. When we went from continuous time signal to discrete time signal we said the Fourier transform becomes periodic. Now, we are observing the dual which is sampling in frequency results in periodic extension periodicity periodizing in time domain. So, the dual duality exists everywhere and that is the beauty of this time and frequency domain analysis there is just enormous uh, applications of this dual properties and so on. So, what we will do tomorrow is we will dwell a bit more on this and I will talk a bit more about DFT and conclude the talk with periodogram show you how to do things in R and then we will start off 
with the spectral densities for random process. That is not much there. Now that you have understood all these basics, all that remains is to understand how spectral density is defined first of all for a random signal and then the wiener kinchin relation will come in and help us in computing the spectral density. Then we will look at spectral densities of white noise and ARMA process and so on. Okay? So, see you tomorrow.